Hello and welcome to the Nomi Key Show. I am Nomi Key Konst. You are watching one of our extensive interviews, these exclusive interviews that we are doing over the holiday season in place of our daily show, but on the daily show. Uh, because part of the reason is we just believe that our team deserves a break. Who would have thought? But the Google monster likes us to feed the algorithms. Uh, and so we thought, what better time to have deep dive interviews with some of our favorite activists, leaders, authors, thinkers, policy experts, uh, than over the holiday season. So I'm, I'm thrilled. And I think uh, I saw this article, and, and it's from an old friend of mine uh, who I've interviewed quite a bit over the years on so many different topics, everything from cryptocurrency to the Fed. Uh, but this one I thought was perfect for not just this moment, but for our show. Because as, as you guys know who watch our show, we try very hard to break down how the system works and how we can move within the system and understand the mechanics of the system. Uh, and I think in the last uh, few weeks, it's been very clear that if we want to move forward on key issues like Medicare for all or other big issues, um, we need to have the power in Congress, but we also need to understand what the pressure points of Congress and of course the Biden administration are. Our guest is Robert Hockett. He is the Edward Cornell Professor of Law at Cornell Law. He's a regular visiting professor of finance at Georgetown School of Business and a regular columnist for Forbes and The Hill, which kind of represent both sides of his experience, uh, the financial side of the Fed, being the attorney for the Fed, and also, if I'm correct, uh, and then also just his, his experience in legislation, where he has advised everybody from uh, Bernie Sanders in both campaigns and in between on the Hill, uh, as well as Elizabeth Warren on key aspects of financial policy. And uh, quite impressively, he has been a, a chief strategist and, and legislative um, uh, policy expert uh, in advising the one and only AOC. I think there's like, I've, I've left off a million things from your resume, but, and I know this because I've had you on and I've had to illustrate other parts of your resume. But for this conversation, I wanted to talk about the, uh, those things because you wrote this article in Forbes, which is, I just love when like progressives break through, you know, the, the, the Forbes machine and kind of break their minds a bit, but it's titled Building Back Better with or without a Senate majority, further details. And it, it, it leads off with this photo of uh, FDR which just starts off with it. So uh, Robert, thanks for joining us. I am very curious, do we have a path, just from the start, do we have a path in pressuring as progressives, as working class people, do we have a path right now in pressuring the neoliberal and, uh, power structures? I mean, we are very likely to win the Senate or not win the Senate, but we still have the presidency in Congress. How do we push through a Republican Senate, a Democratic neoliberal Senate? and get our policies acknowledged and, and passed, frankly. Excellent. Thanks so much, Jimmy. So again, it's, it's, it's a joy to be with you again. Of course, I'm always ecstatic after we do these things. So thanks so much again. And, and thanks in particular for uh, treating this subject in particular, which I fully agree with you is, is exceedingly important at the moment um, and before you know, so we sort of gear up for January 20th and, and, and thereafter. So the, the sort of short answer to your query, I think, is just is a definitive yes, right? An emphatic yes. Uh, and indeed, as the, as the title of the piece that you've uh, kindly noted just now that I put out about a week ago suggests, um, it's sort of the latest in the kind of series of pieces that I've been putting out over the last month and a half or so. So the, the further details reference at the end of that title are sort of suggestive of the fact that that's a piece that's a sort of follow on to a, a piece that preceded it immediately that was on the same question. Uh, and then there are a number of other things I put out in the weeks and months ahead of that that were on the same question. So to make sort of a, a long story short, um, there is on the one, I think there's a, there's sort of four, there's a sort of a four part plan uh, that I think that we can pursue. Uh, and each part has a kind of a plan A version and a plan B version. The plan A version would be the legislated version. Um, and so that would be the one that we would try to get through, of course, if we end up winning both of those Georgia seats uh, in a couple of weeks, um, about which I'm pretty optimistic, by the way. But you know me, I'm kind of metabolically optimistic. I'm optimistic even when there's not a good reason to be. So <laughs> people can discount that uh, my optimism accordingly. But there, there is some empirical reason or external reason, I think, to be somewhat optimistic or hopeful as well. In any event, so the plan A versions would be the versions that we could push through if we get the Senate. Um, the plan B versions, which are almost as good as the plan A versions, are the versions that we could do without the Senate majority. And it's perhaps worth noting also that we wouldn't need executive orders for these, uh, for these plan B versions either. Um, and if we did, you know, if we did 
did need executive orders, I'd be all for them. I think let's do it if we have to. But because those can be controversial in their own right, uh, it seems to be worth noting that they're not even necessary in this particular case. Um, would you like me to elaborate a little bit on the parts? So yeah, let's let's talk about the plan A uh, if we win the Senate. What, what are some of the parts that we can okay. get accomplished? So here would be the plan A versions of all four planks, which I'll be really quick and, and brief about. So the first is to take all of the cabinet level executive agency heads, in other words, all members of the president's and vice president's cabinet, who have jurisdiction over some significant part of the nation's infrastructure or industry and bring them together into one council uh, that I'm calling a National Reconstruction and Development Council. The use of the word reconstruction here is sort of meant to have a bit of a double meaning. On the one hand, I'm really thinking in terms of the post-Civil War reconstruction, which, as you know, was kind of aborted before it was finished. Uh, and in many of the troubles that we have to this very day, I think are attributable to the fact that we never completed that reconstruction. Um, and it's also partly uh, the other sense of the word, of course, is I mean kind of literally rebuilding the country, sort of in that building back better sense that right. Mr. Biden has had in mind. So the idea behind this would be to say, okay, look, you've got you know, people people sort of don't know this or we don't tend to pay attention to it. But, you know, we hear about all these agencies and some people demonize them and say, oh, they're bureaucrats or it's the administrative state or whatever. But but, you know, the layperson typically doesn't think about what each particular department is charged with, what it's supposed to do, what it has jurisdiction over. And as it happens, basically every important part of our nation's critical infrastructure on the one hand and critical or central industries, biggest industries on the other are indeed under the jurisdiction of one or more of these cabinet level executive agencies, which is what we call them. Can I can I just stop for a second? Because right away I'm thinking this is amazing, this is brilliant. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we we all know we need a federal jobs program of some sort, of Green New Deal attached would be amazing uh, to rebuild everything from our bridges and our roads. But oh my God, Pete Buttigieg is going to be potentially our transportation secretary, mm -hmm. who. <laughs> right. So this is part of a this is part of the challenge, of course, right? I mean, so the, the first articulations of this sort of four part plan that I started putting out in, in September were when kind of, you know, we, we had no idea we first of all, we didn't even know whether Biden would win and we didn't have a very good idea as to who he might think about appointing and so forth. And of course now a lot of those questions are answered. And as I think you and I have talked about sort of in private conversation, it's a kind of good news, bad news story so far, right? If if one is it looks at sort of individual appointments or even just uh, suggested, you know, sort of pre preferred, let's say, appointments uh, on a one person by one person basis, there's a lot of bad news in there. Um, there's also some fairly good news in there as well. And so then the question becomes, if we look at the portfolio as a whole, does it look kind of promising or does it look pretty good? Uh, I think it still could end up being so. Janet Yellen would not have been my first choice for Treasury, but she would have Thank been my second. Thank you for saying yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I Yeah. The, 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 the progressives praising her. I'm like, well, hang on a second. Let's just, yeah, exactly. I mean, you are the person who I would ask, frankly. <laughs> Well, that's sweet. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of, I think in sort of glass half full, glass half empty terms here. And I think, you know, if if we take the sort of glass half empty approach, yeah, there's a lot to be, you know, less than fully happy about when it comes to that appointment. Um, but by the same token, when we think in terms of sort of some of the other people who are named and considered, um, it could have been a lot worse as well. So I, I sort of think of her as a kind of, I often sort of hierarchize things or hierarchize things in sort of gold, silver, bronze, metal terms. <laughs> for some reason, I guess from watching too many Olympic games as a kid or whatever, but um, I don't think she would have been the gold, but she's probably somewhere between a bronze and a silver, you know, in, in the sense that it could have been a lot worse. Um, so she's all right. Um, I think that a couple, several of the economic uh, advisory appointments are fantastic. Um, I suspect you and I are both disappointed that Stephanie wasn't named to one or another of Stephanie either. Stephanie Kelton. Yeah, the Stephanie Kelton, it seems to me, it, that was a no-brainer. She should have been on either the CEA or the NEC. I didn't, I, I would never have dared hope or, or believe uh, that she might be named to be the chair of either of those two councils, let alone Treasury Secretary. I mean, it is Joe Biden after all. But it seemed to me that there was a realistic prospect that she might be at least a voice on the NEC or the CEA. Um, and the fact that she's not even a voice in either of those, I, I, I view that as a real I think that's a real 
um, that's a kind of a that's a debit on the credit debit ledger for for president elect Biden. On the other hand, there are some pretty good appointments there that one might not have anticipated. Right. First of all, there definitely are more women economists on these two teams than ever before. And there are also more economists of color on these on these two um, uh, councils than ever before by far. And then finally, thirdly, there does seem to be um, insofar as there's a kind of a thematic commonality among these appointments, the common denominator to almost all of them is that they really focused on inequality as a primary economic problem throughout their so, entire so career. So even though, the, I mean, it's not just that there are women and people of color on, on the, they actually have focused and leaned in on uh, the the inequalities um, and injustices. And, and good. Okay, so that's because that's always a question. Progressives are like, that's great, but if there's they still believe what you know the worst of the worst believe, the, then yeah, exactly. as you know, we you lawyers know, we always we yeah. you know it's never impressive to us if you say to somebody, well, this lawyer is an African American because so is Clarence Thomas, right? <laughs> and exactly. you, you don't want you don't want the kind of Clarence Thomases of of economics to be the kind of you know the the appointments that 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 a president sort of you know bases his or her capacity to say, look how diverse I am uh, on. Um, but happily, they're not that, right? These seem to be, I wouldn't go so far as to call them heterodox economists. Their, their methodological orientations are still pretty orthodox, uh, which is sort of suboptimal. Um, but on the other hand, uh, given that the questions that they've devoted themselves to addressing are very much about justice, social justice in particular, and then both economic, both income and wealth inequality and racial wealth gaps as well as a part of that, I think is a really good sign, at least in the sense that we've never had that before. Even even the the the, the only non-white president that we've had so far didn't have teams that were anything exactly. like this, right? So in that sense, there's some good news here. Um, so I think when it comes to the council then, back to the idea of the National uh, Reconstruction and Development Council, it's, it's going to be a sort of similarly mixed bag, right? You're going to have a Buddha judge on there, uh, for example, um, but you're also going to have uh, a Holland on there, right? And the first Native American appointee to the Department of the Interior. And although she herself doesn't have like the most stellar progressive credentials, she's certainly much more progressive uh, than anybody else who's ever been in that position before. And the fact that a Native American is actually going to be heading up the department that is the sort of primary conduit or the primary sort of access point through which the federal government deals with sovereign Native American tribes all across the country is itself a kind of a good sign. You know, what I'd be worried about is if she therefore is interested in the prerogatives of casinos or something on Native right. American. Right. Which, which she's, be- she's given, I mean, on that side, she's given no indication of having any of those um you know, yes. alignments. Um, I mean, I am curious though, how, uh, from your perspective um, on policy, economic mm. policy, how is she not necessarily the most progressive? Well, she has in the past, I mean, again, she's not, I, I don't want to, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of hesitant to say anything that might get am- am- ammunition to critics who are willing to jump the gun. But sure, yeah, but I'm not trying to get clicks here. I just, I'm just very no, curious no, as no, a no, human. No, of course, you, you of course wouldn't. But um, there, were, she came in. She came under some fire uh, in the past from some Bernie Kratz for having been a little bit too willing to give a pass to mainstream Dems who arguably made things sort of stack the deck against Bernie when he was running, um, that maybe she wasn't- So it was electoral at, stuff, mostly. Yeah, it was, it yeah. was electoral, it was less policy oriented. Yeah. Although sometimes you can think of the electoral orientation as maybe yeah. being a, a reflection of a policy orientation, it's hard to say. And it, it's also, you know, truth be told, I mean, some of our Bernie Krat friends have maybe been you know, borderline paranoid about the, the, the rigging against Bernie. Although there, there clearly has been rigging against Bernie too. So it's never, you know, I don't want to sort of like be across the board, you know, blanket wise dismissive uh, of all of our fellow Bernie Krats who say that the game was rigged against Bernie. In many ways it clearly was. Oh yeah. But I, Right. It's just it's and this is why it's you know it comes down to understanding the process where exactly. there are legitimate concerns versus illegitimate concerns and understanding who's pushing which arguments, why they're pushing it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. Financial motives. <laughs> it, yeah, and, and it, it's always up for up for debate, I suppose, like how stacked it was against them and how stacked it wasn't. And I think reasonable minds can disagree. Um, I think it was in many ways stacked, but I th- we, we I think we probably both have friends who are convinced that it was completely and pervasively 
stacked in a way that's beyond even what you and I might think. And, you know, it, I think it's probably mainly from those folks who I love to death. Uh, I think it's mainly them, however, who have found some fault with Holland. But overall, most folk I know, um, especially people of Native American background, um, are just ecstatic about this appointment. And many, many very bona fide lefties, you know, not means Dems, many stretch are thrilled by this appointment as well. And I take a lot of my cue from those folk as well. And so I think she's a fantastic appointment, right? And there could be some others. Um, at the moment, of course, um, Commerce is still up for grabs, right? Department of Commerce. That's probably going to be a much more important de department than typically is the case, because during times of mass national reconstruction, the Department of Commerce often figures kind of prominently as a almost like a kind of central, kind of like a, a hub type agency in relation to which other agencies are kind of spokes. Um, you know, Herbert Hoover, before he became a ridiculously cautious and therefore, in that sense, reactionary president, was actually a very visionary and proactive Commerce Secretary during the 1920s and did a lot of really cool stuff in that office in a way that had a lot of his fellow Republicans calling him a communist. <laughs> so, uh, and then meanwhile, during the New Deal, uh, Jesse Jones, who kind of literally built the city of Houston, was Commerce Secretary and played a really crucial and transformative role in making the New Deal uh, work. And so it would be really, I think, helpful if Biden were thinking about actually visionary type people for that position. But so far, I've just heard a few names, including uh, John Kasich, who, uh, you know, the, the Republican from Ohio. And, and while I'm grateful to him for addressing the Democratic convention this summer and breaking rank with the Trumpazoids, <laughs> he's not what you would call a, a visionary. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe he has some sensitivity to the, the needs of the Rust Belt being from Ohio. And He didn't do much to, 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 to prevent uh, a crisis like, in Ohio. He was part of that. Yeah. Exactly, right? It's not like he was somehow some kind of heroic, you know, actor sort of, you know, putting his finger in the dike or whatever, trying to prevent. So I think that would be a, a distinctly uninspired choice. And it would be a bad way to be bipartisan. If, if, if Biden wants to go all team of rivals and be bi bipartisan, what he ought to do is appoint like, you know, George Conway to be a special counsel to investigate the crimes of the Trump administration. So that's actually brilliant. Okay, so this is, this is, people lose sight of what the team of rivals utility was. It wasn't yeah. like, oh, come at me from all angles and disagree with the, everything that progressives stand for. It was, yeah. how can I use my rivals yeah. to go after my bigger rivals? Exactly, exactly, right? It's the old idea, keep your enemies, I mean, keep your, your friends close and your enemies closer. Yes. It's a little bit like a variation on that theme. Oh, yeah. um, and, and it also, of course, presupposes that the president, him or herself, have a great deal, you know, long attention span and a capacity to be really on. I mean, Lincoln was a very active president who was very much engaged in every aspect of his administration and his presidency. And so he could use the rivals in an effective way. Um, another person who was really quite superb at that, that he doesn't get enough credit for it now because everybody just remembers him as a movie star looking guy was John uh, JFK, right? JFK sort of famously did not have a chief of staff. He didn't need one and didn't want one. He wanted to be his own chief of staff. And so he appointed, you know, Douglas Dillon was a Republican. That was his treasury secretary. Uh, I believe, uh, was it Dean Rusk was a Republican who was his defense, uh, or his first national security advisor or defense secretary, I forget. But in any event, it kind of worked for JFK because he never actually let them arrive at a consensus with which he then adopted. He just listened to all of their arguments and then made his own call. And, and I think Biden, I don't know that he's gonna be that engaged. Not because he's not, ulti not because he was never capable of it, but he's he's a little past the prime of life, let's say now. And, I and he's also a, a, a product of the Senate. And so, and, and and I say this, like there, there were great hopes at one point where I thought, well, maybe he could be like a Johnson, right? Maybe yeah. he could, in an FDR moment, be a Johnson in terms of pushing through legislation. But my, my greater concern, which leads us to the second part of this is, Okay, so if he doesn't have the Senate, I mean, I think it's a great excuse for him to just throw up his hands in the air and say, I'm sorry, I can't get anything passed the way Obama did for most of his, of course, yeah. most of his uh, his tenure and blaming yeah. it on Fox News and the conservatives and the Tea Party and everybody. But yeah. at the end of the day, um, I think that the Democrats are, 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 are given an opportunity in this crisis. And I hate to say that word, but uh, the, the crisis is the leverage. Yeah. And it's I think if if 
they win in Georgia, I don't really think it's going to be because of some genius democratic strategy. I'm sorry, in Georgia. Um, I don't think it's an, some genius democratic strategy in Georgia. I think it's really because the crisis has propelled people to step up and vote for Democrats because it's the only way out of this economic crisis. If we have the Senate, I think the, all the spotlight will be on B a Biden from every angle. Yeah. If we don't have the Senate, that's where the the, the machinations of, of 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 Senate politics. I mean, the fact that he's cutting deals with the Republicans on China and and excited about them. Not this isn't like, oh, I have to we have to compromise <laughs> here. Right, he's looking it. forward to it publicly, public yeah. statements. Yeah. So, yeah. a world where we have uh, a split. Uh, Washington is split, right? Where right. the Senate is is controlled by Republicans by close margin. Um, mm -hmm. We have Congress and and Biden. What's our path? Yeah, yeah. So I think you know a couple of things here. So first of all, again, the the Plan B versions of these four planks of this plan that I'll, that I'll mention um, are all doable without the Senate. Uh, and sort of secondly and relatedly, I think Biden would do well to take another page out of two former presidents' playbooks that you know nobody seems to have used for a while now. Um, you know, there was plenty of Senate opposition to, to Roosevelt, right? Even from among some of his own party, right? Some of those Southern Democrats, who all of, the, all of today's Republicans are basically former Senate Democrats or the, the descendants of them in effect, right? And um, they were just as reactionary in the 30s as they are now. They just called themselves Democrats. They all mass, of course, when it was thanks to our friend Johnson, LBJ, that they made a mass exodus over to the Republican Party from the Democratic Party. It was all re a response to the Civil Rights Act that he pushed. Um, but these are the same people, basically. You know, these All of today's Southern Republicans were yesterday's Southern Dems. And a lot of those people opposed a lot of what Roosevelt tried to do. And he was brilliant. What he would just sort of say is, you know, I don't really need you... I don't need to convince you people, you bigots, you know, you base, you Jim Crowers. I can go directly to your constituents. And that's sort of what the fireside chats were about. He just went over their heads and it worked. Uh, and then the other person who did that, of course, was Ronald Reagan. Uh, he did it for reactionary you know, ends rather than progressive ends. But, um, you know, as, as you and I have both read and heard uh, over the years, there was a lot of, you know, the Democrats had uh, majorities, uh, I think at least in the House, uh, maybe in the Senate as well, certainly in the House, when Reagan first won election in 1980. You know, Tip O'Neill was the House majority leader. But Reagan got pretty much everything he wanted, nevertheless, because he just got on television and said, my fellow Americans, he just did the, the FDR fireside chat thing. He just did television instead of radio, since we now had televisions. Uh, it worked. You know, all these people called up, you know, Tip O'Neill and other Dems and said, hey, give him a chance. Let him try out the agenda. At least if it doesn't work, we can always you know, reverse it. Uh, and so he got so much of what he wanted. Um, and I think Biden has got to do the same thing. Now, he doesn't have that kind of the kind of charisma, I suppose, that an FDR had, or even that a Reagan had. I think Reagan is, I think his charisma is overstated, but it was still probably- I Agreed, right? yeah. I, I see he knew how I, to speak into a camera in a way that was really missing from a generation. And, and as a result, you know, coming out of the Carter administration, a divided Democratic Party, you know, yeah. I think they were able to kind of, in the same way that, that Trump was, tap yeah. into- to sort of the future of of at a moment where where you know the Cold War was 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 very like raw and yeah. there and yeah. and and Democrats uh, bought into it. <laughs> yep, yep, exactly. And he could kind of play those sides against each other. There was sort of the Teddy Kennedy wing of the party and then the Jimmy Carter wing of the party, and so he was able to do that. And um, you know maybe the general education level of the of Reagan's constituents was such that they could kind of they could fall for his his shtick a little bit more readily than people who are a little bit more critical uh, are. But whatever the story might be, he, he at least seems to have had more charismatic power than Joe Biden probably has. Um, although Biden, you know, it's, it sounds so superficial, but Biden has a, a wonderful, a beautiful smile. It almost makes me kind of want to cry. Uh, he, maybe he should use that. <laughs> Doesn't that sound, what? Doesn't sound absurd, but but every now and then he smiles and you, you, well, they're fake teeth, Robert. Come enough. on, we can all get a Joe it's, Biden it's, smile, it's fake, right? But every now and then he seems to mean that smile, and I just sort of think, you know, you probably are somewhere in in the middle of your soul. There probably is something beautiful. Uh, it's just that you're there's so many layers of a 47 year political career that have kind of crusted over it that it only it only only barely comes through now and then. But anyway, I guess what I'm trying to say.
Well, I mean, they all say he's a decent man. That's what they say. It's, it's, I mean, one-on-one, you might be personable and lovely. I mean, I know, I know plenty of Republicans who send Christmas cards to their opponents. Yeah. And they're very nice people yeah. one-on-one, and then their policies are they're just people. deathly policies, right? Yeah. And by- they just happen to be supported by weapons <laughs> manufacturers. <laughs> exactly. But, I think, you know, but they're, they make a great rhubarb pie. Yeah. And, and, of course, Biden is so, his whole personality seems to have been grown around political ambition for the last 47 years that you can never, it never feels, it never feels, you can never, you never feel like you can be sure that a moment is actually spontaneous or hard. It might be, and probably some percentage of the time it is. It's just, you know, that again, for many more years of his life than not, everything has been calculated, you know, because, and, and so that's what makes it hard, but uh, at least hard for me, at least to know what to think or what to, does, what to feel about the guy. But every now and then it just sort of seems to me that there's something kind of beaming from that smile that looks like he really means it. There's a kind of a twinkle in the eye where I feel like this might be one of those rare moments where it's unfiltered and spontaneous and just really him. And I kind of, if, if that's true, um, I wish he could kind of let that part out more and just be that way more often because he's probably capable of having a kind of charisma. There's, of course, an irony in my suggesting this because I'm suggesting in a certain sense that he make that into a tactic, which sort of defeats the whole point because I'm saying- Because you're trying, I'm, yeah. <laughs> so it might be just not worth even thinking about, but I just, every now and then I find a piece of me sort of wishing he could be more who I think might be his true self, you know, but- I mean, I remember um, Pat Cadell, uh, who passed away uh, two years ago, and he was a Democratic, uh, oper- I mean, very well-known Democratic operative. He, um, you know, he, he helped, he was a pollster who helped get Carter elected. He was like 18 or something at the time, 19. He was like this this young kid, this wonder kid. And then he um, he ended up advising, you know, many Democrats and, and later populists too. He kind of took for turn towards the other side later. But um, the reason I bring him up is, you know, I think, I think he really did want to change the world. And he was, um, it was just, uh, he he was, he was a lot, he was, he was a pollster. He wasn't a, he he wasn't a deep thinker about, you know, how all this stuff uh, would philosophize with voters, right? The the philosophies of all this would, and I say this because later he wrote a speech for Trump and had no idea what he was getting into and then abandoned Trump because he didn't understand that Trump was not there to dismantle the right wing. He was there to (laughs) re, yeah. But Pat Cadell um, was what used to be best friends with uh, Joe Biden. Oh, And I bring this up because I, I remember hearing stories from him about he recruited Joe Biden to run for Senate. Oh, way back yeah. then. Wow. Way back then in Delaware. Yeah. Um, they had known each other. I, I forgot how, but, uh, and he had, he said, you know, they, they really thought deeply about what his first piece of legislation, the thing that he really wanted to push for, and it was campaign finance reform. And he thought that was the crisis of the moment. And so Joe Biden, who remained the poorest senator for, uh, until he was basically vice president, I think, um, was just, it was just kind of an interesting story hearing it from that perspective. Yeah. He ended up, Pacadell, side story, he ended up splitting with the Clintons. Um, and I think some of this whole shift in personality was really because he had a, a major disagreement with the Clintons and parted ways in, I think, 91 when Clinton, Bill Clinton started to take a turn for what we all know ended up becoming yeah. like hardcore yeah. neoliberalism. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, yeah. I just, I, I always thought the stories about early Joe Biden were very revealing. And then I'm like, what happened? Where'd he go? Yeah, happened? <laughs> and they, and by the way, they didn't talk anymore. Um, yeah. He yeah. also, Pacadell split away from when he started oh, he to take a turn. Biden as well. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a kind of a, an interesting character to me in some ways, Biden, because it, it does seem like he, he did his initial instinct apparently were kind of blue collar that that scranton identity thing seems to be really constitutive of him even if it was only his childhood that he spent there he really seems to identify kind of deliberately like he wants to think of himself as the scranton guy and and, and that's sort of promising in a sense um, but then at the same time he's always sort of been a bit of a buffoon until at least until recently right i mean i think the first election that i was actually paying any real close attention to was that 88 cycle um, and when he did that sort of Neil Kinnock bit, the whole, I mean, I just thought- It was a, a speech by the labor leader of UK. It was a, a copied yeah. speech. Yeah, just totally plagiarized. He Whether he knew it or not, though. I mean, that, that's one of those things that like, you're thing. running for president, you have, are you checking, you are, 
they have speech writers. So yeah, yeah. And he he just always struck me for a long time. He struck me as a kind of just a perennial candidate. Like he was just running because he wanted to run, because he, he he felt like somehow he was entitled to the position or he was a good bet or something or who knows. But you know, he he he, he never struck me as somebody who had like a vision. It seemed to me like the cart kind of came before the horse with him, which is probably unfair of me. But and then of course you know a lot of those episodes that he's notorious for, like the Anita Hill hearing uh, or the the Thomas hearings, but with Anita Hill as the as the prime witness and all that stuff. You know, so even to the point where, as as you know, um, as recent as less than a year ago, I mean, within this very calendar year, as late as early March, I was still saying you know profoundly nasty things about Joe Biden, kind of un in some ways unfair. I mean, referring to him as a demented hair sniffer. And, you know, I was, I was probably meaner than Clinton. I mean, then <laughs> Freudian slip there. I was probably meaner than Trump was about Biden for quite a while there. And and actually, some of the nice things I say now might almost be subconscious overcompensation because I feel guilty about some of well, them. I, I mean, my, my perspective on this is, uh, listen, this is a guy who's been in office for literally his entire adult life, right? Yeah. And, yeah. you know, yes, he's experienced tragedy and yes all of, but he made conscious decisions to go the neoliberal path it's not like we didn't have a vibrant progressive wing we did True. i mean yeah. up until we lost we had the democratic party for 30 years had control of congress until bill clinton took office and then they made a very conscious effort joe biden part of that to sign mm -hmm. on to bills and help push bills uh like that they criminalized one in three black men in america yeah. uh that put them in it literally just dis disturbed deconstructed, you want to talk about reconstruct, deconstructed communities across this country and hurt communities across this country. And so, yeah, while he might have ounce, you know, an ounce of like uh, uh, memory of, of, of being Scranton Joe, um, I think he, he has co-opted this working class just like Donald Trump has. And yeah. he's literally doing nothing, nothing. I mean, we no, we do not have a secretary of labor yet, but that does not mean the only labor message should be coming from the labor department. You yeah. know, Pete Buttigieg, he has no experience in transportation other yeah. than being a mayor, which has limited bus lines and their <laughs> and their small South Bend, Indiana city. Um, so it's just it's just it's shocking to me that in this moment, in this crisis, Joe Biden who literally does not have to do anything else in his career. Yeah, I'm sure there are a lot of people he has to, he has to uh, give patronage jobs to and help him get to the top. But the reality is you're, the, you're gonna be the president. You don't know anybody anymore. You, yep. have, you have the control. You yeah, have the yeah. control. You don't need to work your way up the system anymore. So yeah. now you have a crisis, FDR mm. level crisis, and you're sitting on your hands and mm. listening to the lobbyist, which mm. makes me think that he has been conditioned. It could well be, right? I mean, this is sort of, I think you and I are exactly on the same page on this. This is sort of, simul there's a sort of a paradoxical quality to this, right? That it's simultaneously the greater reason to hope for something better from him and the best, the best reason to be exceedingly disgusted if he doesn't end up doing something better. Because I, I've actually been thinking of it in, in almost exactly the same words that you just laid out. I've been thinking he needs nothing more it's the gold watch. He, there's no, he's, there's nothing to be promoted to. He's also late enough on in his life that it's not like he has to worry about, you know, an old age in poverty if he alienates the moneyed interests. I mean, he's he's set for life, literally set for life, uh, materially speaking. In addition to being, you know, sort of at the apex of his of his career. Um, and for that reason, I sort of thought, well, so maybe. He'll figure, okay, I don't have to satisfy the credit card industry anymore, or I don't have to kind of kiss up to this interest or that interest, um, and that might mean that he will, he'll, you know, he'll actually stop listening to these people and he'll do what looks right. On the other hand, again, if he doesn't, then it'll be all the more reason to be disgusted, and it'll be a good reason, a very good reason, to conclude what you've just suggested, which is that maybe it's just become second nature to him now. He's conditioned, he's just basically become that person without maybe even being altogether deliberate about it or conscious. He just evolved into that. Just like they say that, you know, kind of the surroundings or the environment that you let yourself be a part of in time becomes sort of constitutive of you. It's a sort of, there's a sort of, I guess, symbiotic relation between ourselves on the one hand and the environments that we enter into on the other, right? We, 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 we enter into them not fully corrupt, but then we've come to be corrupted by them over time if we haven't made a real deliberate effort to avoid corrupting environments. 
And he obviously has not made a significant effort in his life to avoid all corrupting environments. And, and to top it off, you know, just to sort of sharpen your, I mean, to kind of add an additional sort of point to, to the lance, as it were, or to the, to the set of lances that you just put forward, you know, not only is it true, like what you said, that there, it's not like there was not a left when he was in the Senate, but even somebody he purported to be really friendly with and somebody from a family that he purported to be wanting to emulate the members of was there. I'm referring to Ted Kennedy, um, who, you know, as he, you know, Ted Kennedy wasn't as progressive as he might have been, but he was certainly a lot more progressive than Biden was. And Biden likes to think of himself as this kind of Irish Catholic liberal, a kind of another, like the, the JFK of Scranton or something. <laughs> and there he was. He was colleagues with Ted Kennedy right until 2010. Exactly. Right? When, but, and, uh, and, 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 I don't see anything, you know, he was not with Ted Kennedy on stuff. <laughs> it's it's very strange, actually, like, you know, I'd love to do a show basically go tracking kind of the, the Democratic tribes from from the 60s to to yeah. uh, to 2010, let's say, because yeah. there was this division even, you know, it's not that Kennedy was the most progressive, but he represented a more progressive wing than, say, the Carter administration and the neoliberals. Yeah. And yet we saw, we saw at least in 2008, especially because Kennedy supported um, Obama. We saw Obama at that time as being part of that lane. And he ended up yeah. being far more conservative, strangely enough, yeah. I believe, than, than, than Hillary Clinton would have been, which is like kind of, you know, talk about a mind boggle. I mean, at least Hillary Clinton supported public schools yeah. and, and received yeah. education funding. And, yeah. and I mean, and uh, it, it, was, it was just, yeah. it's just the lines kind of went in all directions. And I, I think knowing where those tribes were, and this is, I think, what's so um, refreshing about Bernie Sanders, who also was a form of a perennial candidate for a while, uh, yeah. he just kind of stuck to his own lane. And I think part of what made him so powerful was that when he was in Congress, as an independent, it wasn't so much that he was an independent, which they love throwing out. He's not a Democrat. He's not a Democrat. It's that yeah. when you're you're an independent, you don't have to do those fundraising committee games that everybody else does, which makes you a creature of the institution and beholden to the institution and and, and yeah. the money. And yeah. he just did his own thing and yeah. sat there on the floor, you know, uh, 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 protesting the Iraq War vote, well, with nobody watching except for a C-SPAN cameraman. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, I used to, as, a, as a sort of a gag, I would sometimes, you know, during the two campaigns, I would find these old speeches that he gave in the 1980s um, and point out that if you just sort of systematically change some of the numerical terms that the same speech, right? So in 82, it's you know, a nation of 180 billion, 180 million people, blah, blah. And you just, the same speech, you know, now, a nation of 300 billion people, da, 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 da. Or, you know, if we get a GDP of $5 trillion and then a GDP of $20 trillion, um, which is beautiful. Beautiful, right? And you know, some people say, well, doesn't he ever, he's like a broken record. And you think, well, yeah, that just means he's true to the message, right? I mean, we still haven't done it, right? So he's still telling us to do it. Um, but but yeah, I think you're right. I mean, there's the, the, the these weird, like you said, these sort of tribal divisions within the parties themselves and within both houses of Congress and the, the sort of the ways in which certain people have felt either compelled to or desirous of aligning themselves with or identifying themselves with various among these tribes then ends up sort of in many ways constituting their identities going forward. And it would be wonderful if Biden, you know, has a kind of a, a trend, a self-transcending capacity where he could just suddenly have a moment of awakening where he says, holy crap, I needed all that, those affiliations. You had to have a, you know, just like, like people in some rough parts of some cities feel like they have to join a gang in order to have a support group. Otherwise you get eaten alive. You, it'd be great if he were able to say, yeah, I needed to belong to a gang. I needed a posse or else I would have been swallowed up. I, I, I never would have gotten anywhere in Congress. But, you know, I, I don't really need a posse anymore. That's kind of what the president is. The presidency is for is to have a posse less leader. So having at least one person who's not beholden to anybody. Exactly. You know? And I mean, we have to wrap up, but I, yeah. I my theory on this, and I'd love to hear your, your final take on it is, I think the only thing that um, is blaringly obvious is that this administration is not set, being set up necessarily for a Biden administration as much as a Harris administration, which is uh, has has sort of um, inherited a lot of the Clintonian, uh, at least political aspects. I mean, there's just a lot of the the Clintonian folks that are 
are and and Obama folks um, because you know she supported Obama of course too. So it's just interesting. I mean, you look at the transition committee and how many people came out of Har- literally Harris's family, uh, and also you know some of the Clinton, Clinton folks that are not Biden people, and yeah. and even the Obama folks that were not Biden people. I mean, Rahm Emanuel. I don't think Rahm Emanuel and Joe Biden have a necessarily great relationship. And granted, he oh, hasn't God. been appointed to anything yet, yeah. but. Uh, <sighs> It's, it's, and there's no way of canceling these people either. Like Rahm Emanuel is probably as close to being canceled as possible. And yet here yeah. he comes. Yeah. I mean, if, you know, if you wanted to put him to use, you should make him like a prison guard in Guantanamo <laughs> until we shut down Gitmo, right? I mean, it's like, you know, put these people in the right places. If oh you really feel like you have to, like you owe patronage or something to various wings of the party or whatever. First of all, like we were saying, why would you feel that way? But if you do, at least be smart about where you put them, you know, put George Conway in the special counsel's office to go <laughs> after the Republicans. So then when people saying say you're being vindictive and partisan, say, I'm not being partisan. He's a Republican, for fuck's sake. He's the husband of Cal- Kellyanne Conway, right? Yeah. Um, and put, again, make Rahm Emanuel like, you know, like a Gitmo guard and, and just put them where they belong. Put him, for, put him in, now forget about Gitmo, put him in a, a, a like the, Ebs, not the Epstein, the Weinstein, like over, like, oh, I yeah. don't want him to, if, if he has these, 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 these tendencies, use it against the worst people. I mean, there are plenty yeah, of yeah. folks, you know, at Gitmo exactly. too, that are, yeah, set the rats on rats. You know, don't, don't, don't rats put, on rats. Love it. <laughs> rat on rat violence, man. <laughs> don't don't put them in the dove seats. You know. Right. Where does Pete Buttigieg go then? Fundraiser, yeah, like he point. should just raise all of the money for all of the projects that don't get accomplished. Just like yeah, maybe yeah. I'm trying to think. Like, yeah, he should be in some position where he lectures people but has no influence at all, right? <laughs> but he can feel good, like he can just like be. I don't know. I, I thought for a while, I thought he'd make a good press secretary, for example. Motiv- motivational speaker. He could just yeah, run but- through the halls of the White House and just say, team, you're doing great. Yeah. <laughs> that would be even better. Because that way we don't like have him in the public eye where yeah. he's, he sort of kind of makes people, he's kind of cringy, uh, I think, for a lot of people. He's got, uh, you know, but, he, but yeah, so just have him running around cheerleading in the West Wing or something. <laughs> you know, running around with pom-poms. <laughs> Oh, or send him back to Mackenzie. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I love so, it. Yeah. All right, Robert Hackett, great conversation. Very thoughtful. Go check out uh, his article uh, in Forbes. We'll put it in the information section of both the podcast and uh, on YouTube so you can see it there. But um, as always, a pleasure having a conversation with you. Hopefully, post-COVID, we can we can sit down in person again like we used to in the old days. And well, let's do definitely do it again, Novi. I'm looking forward to that. You, you take good care. A joy to talk to you again, and we'll be in touch, of course. Happy holidays. Okay, you too. Happy holidays, Novi. Bye. Bye. <laughs> and to everybody else, make sure to smash that like button and subscribe if you're watching on, on YouTube. And if you are not already a member of our new book club, this is very exciting. Go to patreon.com slash the Nomi Key Show. We have three book, book club levels. You can read one book a month. You can read two books a month. Or if you're as crazy as I am, because I'm gonna have to do this now, four books a month. And we have conversations with authors and thinkers either the authors of that book or thinkers who have opinions, who've read the book, um, and we're gonna be answering your questions as well. So so make sure to join that now. First few book club members get a free copy of the famous Professor Harvey K book. It's Thomas Paine and the Promise of America. This is our first book. Why this is important, it is, um, if folks may not be aware of this, but he was a rebel. He was a real revolutionary, right? And Katrina Vanden Heuvel says it herself on the cover, must reading for today's aspiring democratic rebels and radicals. This is American radicalism. We're going to go into other aspects and we're going to do some deeper dives into colonialism. I've got some books mapped out for the next three months. Um, Going to be a diversity of books, a diversity of thoughts. I'm super excited about this. So definitely join now because you get that book for free. All right, take care, everybody, and be well. Thanks, Robert, for sitting through that. <laughs> oh, of course. I, mean, I love that. That was, that was wonderful. Now I'm going to join the book club. <laughs> Yay! Love it. <laughs> I'll be there, man. All right. Well, happiest of holidays, and, we, and take care, and then talk to you soon then. Take care. Okay, bye. Thanks for watching and listening to The Nomi Key Show. But remember to click like and subscribe on YouTube and please share on social media. If you're not already a patron, please join us for as low as $5 a month on patreon.com slash The Nomi Key Show for early and special content. That investment makes a huge difference. We are not corporate media raking in the dough. It's really you guys that are keeping us going. So please consider being a patron. And to our current patrons, thank you so much. We are incredibly grateful to you. 
We also now have swag. So check us out on the nomihisho.com to get your mugs, your totes, and your stickers.